Welcome everyone. I'm just giving everyone a few more minutes to join in. We have about 30, a little less than 30 participants joining us today. So I'm just gonna give everyone another second and then we'll get started. Great, well, it looks like most of us are here. So I just wanna welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming to our first webinar, part of this mini webinar series hosted by Down East Coastal Conservancy and Down East Lakes Land Trust. We're so happy that you guys could all be joining us today. If you wanna take a moment and say hi, let us know who you are or where you're coming from, you can just drop that in the chat. It'd be really cool to see who's here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kathy. I'm Down East Coastal Conservancy's Membership and Outreach Director. And DCC, for anyone who doesn't know, is a Washington County Land Trust we have several properties along the coast from Subban up to Lubeck, and our office is based in Machias. And then joining me today is Kendall from Down East Lakes Land Trust. Kendall, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Kendall, I'm the Education and Events Coordinator with the Down East Lakes Land Trust. We are, a, we are a land trust based out of Grand Lakes Stream, so we're a little bit more inland. We have uh, approximately 56,000 acres. We're devoted to the long-term economic and environmental well-being of the Down East Lakes, Re Lakes region through exemplary management of forests and waters. Uh, back to you, Kathy. Great. Thanks so much, Kendall. Like I said, we're super excited that we can be co-hosting this webinar series together today. So before I introduce our guest speaker, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping, um, some tech things. So we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation today. But if you have a question in the meantime, just feel free to drop it in the chat. Kendall and I will be looking out for those questions and we'll definitely make sure that they all get answered before the end of the webinar today. Also at the end during the Q&A session, if you want to ask your question directly to Hazel, you can do that by using the raise your hand feature. It should be kind of at the bottom of your screen and we'll be able to unmute you. So you'll be able to talk directly to Hazel. If you can't find this function, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and pop your question in the chat and we'll read it out loud or send us a message in the chat that says like, hey, can you unmute me? And we'll take care of that for you guys. I also just wanna let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you wanna go back and reference something later or share it with your friends and family, you'll be able to do that. So we're gonna send you a link in the next couple of days to that recording. So with all of that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today, Hazel Stark. Hazel is the co-founder of the Maine Outdoor School. She is an experienced naturalist educator and a registered Maine guide. And we are thrilled that she could join us today to talk all about nature phenology. So welcome, Hazel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Kendall, for hosting this webinar. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm also excited to see we have some participants from all over, including out of state. So um, that's really exciting. And I'm excited that there are even some phenology observations already rolling in there with a woodchuck out there. I have not seen a woodchuck yet here in Maine. Um, quite yet. So I'll say a little bit more about myself here in just a moment. I'm going to share my screen because I've got some photos to go with everything today. So um, Kathy and Kendall, can you see that okay? Perfect. Okay. So um, we're going to start today thinking about what study of seasonal changes in nature. So we're going to dive into that in just a moment so you have a clear picture of what it is. But uh, as a little bit more, more background um, about me, I do, I, as Kathy said, I co-founded Maine Outdoor School L3C in uh, 2016 with my husband, Joseph Horn. And we have been primarily specializing in providing custom standards aligned outdoor learning opportunities in schools. We also provide educational guided experiences for visitors and locals alike. So guided hikes and guided canoe paddling experiences. And we also provide professional development for adults wanting to incorporate outdoor learning into their work. So that usually uh, means teachers, but it also has meant land trust educators and others who are looking to do more educational programs really rooted in best practices of place-based education. So that's a little bit about Maine Outdoor School for those of you who are interested. And 
The next piece is my um, podcast and radio show, The Nature of Phenology. So that is a radio show that Joe and I uh, started doing a few years ago for community radio station WERU-FM, which is based in Orland, Maine. And it's really just a five minute weekly feature about what's going on in nature each week. So you know what to look for and provides a little bit more depth about what that particular thing is. So I will give you a heads up that all of the phenology observations and things to be looking for this spring that I'll be talking about today are all entire episodes of their own of the nature of phenology. So you can find that through the blog, the nature of phenology.wordpress.com to read past transcripts or download or listen to past episodes. Um, and you can also subscribe as a podcast to the nature of phenology if you like to get a weekly daily dose of what's going on in nature. Um, also, for those of you who may have heard of this, I also the excerpt uh, excerpts from each of those transcripts print in the Machias Valley News Observer each week as well. So you might have heard of me or some of my work um, from there as well. So here's what we're going to do today. We'll, as I said, first talk about what phonology is so that we're all on the same page about that. We'll then talk about why we would track our phonology observations, both from a scientific benefit perspective, as well as our own personal um, benefit. And then we'll go into what to be looking for in nature this spring. So I have a whole bunch of photos and we'll just talk through some cool things to be on the lookout for. And then I'll open up for Q&A for about 15 minutes at the end. But like Kathy said, if you have something to share, uh, feel free to put it in the, the chat or Q&A as we go along. And Kathy and Kendall will let me know if there's anything relevant for me to speak to as we go, because I don't see all of those as they pop up while I'm sharing my screen. So what is phenology? Another way of describing phenology is the timing of natural occurrences throughout the season. So it's really nature's calendar. So here are some examples of phenology observations that you might have in um, the middle of the summer. So when Katie did start singing, that's an important phonology observation. They're not always singing. They're not singing right now. So paying attention to when they sing from year to year. When geese are migrating, I know that I've been noticing the Canada geese have been flying through again after a few months of not really in this area. I've just started noticing them in the past week. Also in the in sort of mid to late summer when the fireweed seeds are floofing, not an official scientific term, but I think describes what they do very well. Uh, they start blooming beautifully, big pink flowers in right around the 4th of July here um, in the Millbridge area. And then they go to seed, which is caught in the wind and makes beautiful um, white fluffs going out in, into the wind in late summer. And then another phenology observation would be when you're noticing monarch caterpillars eating milkweed. So those are all examples of when things are happening in nature and what to be looking for. So there are many personal benefits of being a phenology observer. And so I'm gonna start with those for those of you who are not sure that you love the idea, and then we'll go into some scientific benefits. So, the first piece about being a phenology observer is it requires you to spend some time outside in green spaces or even just through your window. Um, whether you live in a city or a really rural area, there's, there's phenology, there's stuff going on in nature all around you. And so there was a great article in Time Magazine from a couple of years ago that said, uh, that showed through research that spending just 20 minutes in a park makes you happier. And Beyond that, it, it talked about how it lowers your blood pressure and your heart rate, and you don't even have to exercise outdoors to get those benefits. Exercising, of course, does enhance the mental health benefit even more, but you can simply be outside in a green space for 20 minutes and get those benefits. Um, you can also get a little, some of those benefits just a little bit less, even through a window. Um, and then you still get some benefits from looking at even art of green spaces as well. Not as much as being out in green spaces, but it really shows that time spent in nature, looking at nature really helps us feel better, um, both physically and mentally. So it decreases stress as well, spending time outdoors or looking at the outdoors. It decreases our levels of cortisol and it improves self-esteem and mood. So those are also some great benefits. 
It also improves concentration and memory. So they've looked at children diagnosed with ADHD that have been found to concentrate better after just 20 minutes outside. And even older with college students who are asked to memorize and repeat sequences of numbers back to researchers, they were much more accurate after a walk in nature compared to those who did not go into nature um, after trying to memorize those numbers. And it also really, spending time outside increases academic engagement. And so whether you're actually a student or not, you're just trying to learn something at any age, spending time outside and then trying to learn something allows for just more engagement and, and attention. Um, so this one particular study looked at this nature effect that allowed teachers to teach uninterrupted for almost twice as long during a subsequent indoor lesson. So um, those are some really important reasons. If you didn't have enough already about why to spend some time outside, that is really valuable. So if you're here, you probably already know or like the outdoors and looking at it. And so let's talk a little bit more about the wider ranging benefits of being a phrenology observer next. So by paying attention to phenology, so when things in nature are happening throughout the year, it can provide really valuable data to help scientists understand trends in how the climate is changing. So if you start noticing that particular flower blooming earlier every year, that could be really important data for scientists to know. And they're only gonna know it if people all around the world in all different areas are sharing their data with science, with scientists so that they can start noticing um, some trends. And beyond providing that data to scientists, you also get to start realizing how trends are occurring in your own backyard and then use that information to predict the future, which is one of my favorite parts um, where you're able to predict when your local fruits are going to be ready for picking or when to start looking for ospreys returning, for example. I know for me, I always feel like a bit of a bird when I'm thinking like, okay, so it's almost the end of March. I should be looking for turkey vultures coming back to this area because I haven't seen one yet. And by looking back at my phenology journals that I've kept, I know that I saw one on Mount Desert Island a couple of years ago on March 9th. And last year, I didn't see one until around March 27th in the Cherryfield area. So I start noticing and paying attention more as I'm driving around or, or walking around what to be looking for and write it down when I see it, the date and the location. And then I get a lot better every year of knowing when to find things. And that's fun just for me to see different species coming back. That's always really reassuring. But it's also really nice, like if you have a favorite blackberry patch that isn't right in your backyard or on your daily commute, that you love going to pick those blackberries every summer. If you track that over the years, then you'll be able to better remember when to go there to get the ripe fruits. And you'll also start noticing if that changes over, over the years, if you're always tracking that. So those are some reasons that we can record our phenology observations and why that's valuable. So, Diving a little bit deeper into that is the concept of phenological mismatch. So phenological mismatch is when different, um, like two different occurrences that usually happen in concert with each other uh, stop happening um, in the same kind of order that they used to. So for example, this is a photograph of a snowshoe hare that's still white, but it's on the ground that doesn't have snow on it anymore. So um, what we've found is that snow has started to melt sooner than snowshoe hair coats change back to brown these days. And through a study that I believe was in um, Northern Europe, they found that for every week the hair is mismatched, it had a 7% higher chance of being killed by predators like the lynx. So that mismatch between snow melt changing, which of course, we as humans have been able to change, um, change the climate really short compared to how long it took a snowshoe hare to evolve the changing of its coat color. 
So of course a snowshoe hare isn't going to be able to match its coat color to the changing climate and the, um, the increasingly early melting snow. So we have some phenological mismatch happening that ultimately can influence the populations of the snowshoe hares negatively because they're more likely to get killed by their predators because they stick out like crazy. Some other examples of phenological mismatch are there was an, uh, a study in Finland where they were looking at two ground nesting birds that historically they built their nests in barley fields after the farmers planted those fields in the spring. And that was fine because the farmers at that point would leave the fields alone for the barley to grow. And by the time the ground nesting birds eggs had hatched and birds had fledged, they were out of the way before farmers um, came back in to, to harvest uh, their, their barley. Um, but with warmer, warmer temperatures, those birds can nest earlier and they're nesting earlier than the farmers um, are planting. And so they're much more likely now to get crushed by tractors and other me that do that, that planting because they have started nesting a lot sooner. And they found that within about the past 40 years, the farmers are reacting to the change in climate by planting one week earlier, but the birds are laying their eggs two to three weeks earlier. So it also shows that changes in climate does not um, influence the phenology of different species equally. So for birds, they've recognized, okay, two to three weeks is, is better for us <laughs> to do that a little bit earlier, but for farmers, it's only been one week. And so as a result, um, there's a mismatch in what used to actually work quite well between the birds and the farmers. And the last example of phenological mismatch, though I, I love uh, learning about phenological mismatch because it really, um, really makes you think about how many things are connected on the planet. There are just so many prime examples. So if you really want to nerd out after this, you can Google phenological mismatch and learn a lot more about it. But one of the other ones that is a prime example that you'll find really quickly is around the flowering of milkweed and the return of monarch butterflies and other pollinators. So milkweed is uh, over over recent years has started flowering earlier. But just like with the snowshoe hare, the milkweed doesn't, you know, it's not able to yell to the monarchs and other pollinators like, hey, I'm, I'm ready early, come on back because I need to be pollinated and I'm like ready for you to lay eggs on me. Those pollinators don't know that. They can't just like come back early. And so often what that means is that they're coming back a little bit late for the milkweed, which hurts both species. It hurts the milkweed because there are fewer pollinators that are helping them out um, and going to fruit. And then um, for, the, for the pollinators, there's a little bit less food or, or less um, ideal habitat for them to lay their eggs. So um, we're, we're not quite sure what that's really going to mean in the long term. And so collecting data about the different species when they're flowering, when they're fruiting, when different um, animals are, are migrating back, that's all really important because they probably rely, they do rely on some other species. And when we can and see the trends moving at different rates that can really help us know the ways that um, climate change is, is affecting our ecosystems and also give us ideas for mitigating the effects of climate change. So for example, what other native plants can we make sure we have available if pollinators are coming back a little bit later uh, for, for food and habitat so that we, have, we still have a welcoming place for migrators that are coming back late compared to when things are flowering, for example. So what you notice really matters. And so there are several ways that you can submit your observations. So it is useful to scientists. So here are a few basic resources. There's a lot out there on the internet that you can really dive into, but these are some of my favorites. So I'll start with sort of the more um, casual data input and kind of move to the more formal ones, depending on what scale you might be interested in. So iNaturalist is an app that's free that you can get on your smartphone. You also can access it through a web browser on a computer. And iNaturalist allows you basically take a photo of something in nature and you can input where you saw it, the date that you saw it, and then if you know what it is, you can plug in the species name, but if you don't know what it is, you can open it up to the community for people to help you identify. 
So it can be a good learning tool where um, there's a lot of really smart people using iNaturalist and they can help you learn some of the things that exist in your backyard. But also the more people that, um, that identify something for you, the more, the more likely it is that you have taken a, a good photo of a good data point that's reliable. And so what iNaturalist says is that they actively try to distribute the data in venues where scientists and land managers can find it. So, you know, you're not definitely plugging your data into a data set that's definitely being used by scientists, but it is data that is made available to, um, to scientists. And so uh, it can be a really good one that's very casual. You can take a quick picture. Of course, you want to have high quality photos. And the location and date really does matter, um, though you can hide your privacy for location if you're worried about that too. So like I don't put, you know, when I find something in my actual backyard, I don't put, you know, my actual address, I'll put a more broad area. That makes me feel a little bit safer, <laughs> um, especially if it's something really rare or unique that I've seen and I don't want people like running over to my backyard or wherever it is to find this rare thing that should really be left alone. But iNaturalist is great because it is a good, a good learning tool and um, does contribute valuable data. The next one is eBird. So for any of you who love birding, whether that's just through your window looking at a bird feeder or a city street or in a rural spot where you're able to go for a hike and be able to see a bunch of birds, eBird is kind of that next level up from iNaturalist um, where you're able to submit what birds that you've seen that you already know and are confident about what their identity is. If you're not at that level of being a confident birder yet, an app called Merlin, which is also through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, is a really good one because it's free, which is nice. It's available offline on your smartphone, which is also nice because I know that I hike in a lot of places where I don't have cell phone service. And it allows you to download, um, you know, a pack of birds for your region, like the Northeast US. And you basically just put in, when you see a bird, you put in basically five characteristics about it, its size, its color, what it's doing, that kind of thing. And then it gives you a, a sequence of birds that it, it probably is. So it helps, it helps you narrow down your possibilities and helps you get to know the birds by looking at a bunch of photos of the birds and you can listen to their songs and things like that. So it's a really valuable one um, to start getting into birding. And once you get more confident, you can then more confidently submit your birding data to eBird. So the USA National Phenology Network is a really great resource if you want to learn more about phenology and dive into a little bit of data and just learn more about what they're doing as a big network. So I definitely encourage you to visit their website, usanpn.org, to dive in a little bit more deeply. But Nature's Notebook, which is one of their projects, and also there is a um, a signs of the seasons training that UMaine's Cooperative Extension puts on and you can see their URL there if you want to dive in. Those are a couple of different ways where you can actually do a formal project focused on phenology and for example you can set up a plot in your own backyard and have a sequence of steps for um, looking for a particular plants flowering or whatever it is that they want you to look for and track that over time. So that can be really nice if you're looking for like a family project or you really just want a set of rules and ideas of how to be a, a formal phenology observer and um, really dive in that way. So Nature's Notebook is a, is a great um, thing to look into if that kind of thing interests you. And lastly, before we dive into the lookout for the spring, Great way to get into phenology observations is just writing it down and keeping a nature journal. And so these are a couple of templates that I really like for um, people who like to draw their observations. So you can create a wheel that maybe you want to make a phenology observation every day. So you make a slice of pie for every day of the week, or you could do it for every week of the year or every month of the year. And you might just capture one thing that for you really shows what the season was all about in a given month or day or week. And then once you've created your wheel, you end up with a really beautiful representation of what, what has changed throughout the year. So for example, if I were to do this one on the right, 
for February, I might put in there, um, I might draw a picture of a bobcat or a bobcat tracks because I saw a lot of bobcat signs this past February. And I found that past Februarys, I've also noticed bobcats more in my area in that particular month. So that for me might be what I would re represent for the month of February. And then for March, I might have something that's really representing the impacts of ice melting because as ice melts, you know, beavers are able to come out of there, otters are coming out from under the ice, um, and all sorts of critters like ducks are taking advantage of having more liquid water available that allows them to kind of go in and out and explore. And so that for me is what, what March is all about. And so you can create these really beautiful journals like that. And I'll also say that um, if you would like some downloadable templates and more ideas about nature journaling with phonology in mind, you can go to Maine Outdoor School's website and click on our virtual programming tab. And that is a great place to go because we have been collaborating with Women for Healthy Rural Living, also in Millbridge, where we created a series of videos through the OWL or Outdoor Women Lead program last summer. And one of those, those um, videos we created was all about phonology journaling. And there are free downloadable templates for you and a video that I created that tells you a lot more about phonology journaling so you can dive in a little deeper if you'd like to. So now we're going to move into what to be on the lookout for this spring. And I will invite you as I go through each photo, I don't have the photos labeled. I will invite you to pop into the chat what you think each thing is. So what the species is and the top two people who have the most answers correct at the end of this, I will, I will mail you a main outdoor school sticker. So um, pop your information or uh, pop your answers in the chat and we can be in touch for your mailing address later on for me to get you those stickers if you want one. And um, so we're going to start with this first one and see if any of you know what species that is. Maybe not, you know, the species, it's sort of general category. See if anyone knows. Okay, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's an early stonefly, so they're pretty tiny, and all of these that I'm going to, um, these spring signs, I am going to show you in order of now until June, so it's the order that you would see them. So early stoneflies, you really start noticing end of February, beginning of March, I've seen a few already this year, they emerge this time of year kind of surprisingly, um, they'll be looking for mates soon, and you'll see them out on the snow and they have a really distinctive um, paired tail that you can see there uh, that really tells you that it's a stonefly. If you know this one, pop it in the chat. This is a flower that's just starting to flower in Southern Maine. I haven't seen it up here yet. Let's see. Yeah, got it. it's skunk cabbage. Good. Yeah, this is skunk cabbage. Um, this is a really cool flower. We are earliest flowers in this region, and it's especially cool because it has this amazing ability to create some heat so they can actually warm up and melt the snow around them, which is really valuable for them because, of course, pollinators are more likely to find them quicker, which is nice. And for creatures like bears that will be emerging from hibernation, they are really great sources of food for them and other creatures that are looking for some fresh green food um, after a long winter without it. So skunk cabbage is a unique one. And they really, you know, they are really common in the places where they're common. I don't see a lot of them in Washington County. Um, I have seen a ton of them on Vinyl Haven Island. For any of you who've been there, a lot of the hiking trails go through these massive skunk cabbage patches. They're definitely around, but they can be a little harder to find depending on where you are. Next up is a particular favorite flower of mine. Let's see if anybody knows what species this is. Mm 
your worm with witch hazel, though they're not closely related. So this is, this is beaked hazelnut. So um, beaked hazelnut has these little pink flowers. They're usually no more than like a quarter inch across. Witch hazel has these sort of spidery yellow um, flowers that come out in October, right around Halloween. There's also a spring witch hazel that exists in some places too. But beaked hazelnut does tend to bloom um, very soon if you're not seeing it already. And it, you can see in the backdrop of this picture that there's hardly any green around when you see them. And uh, so it's especially nice to see because it's one of those nice bursts of color that's super subtle and you really have to be looking for it because they're so tiny, but totally worth it when you find it. And if you have any hazelnuts that grow in your yard, you can snip off the twigs and bring them inside and put them in some water and they'll bloom early for you. So I did that. Um, on Valentine's Day, we got a whole twiggy stick bouquet and brought them in and our hazelnuts have already come and gone. Um, and now our alders that we picked have started leafing out. So that's kind of fun to be able to see spring on fast forward if you pick some woody twigs and bring them inside. All right, who knows what this butterfly is? Another favorite sign of spring. Morning cloak, you got it, Clayton. That's a morning cloak butterfly. So unlike monarch butterflies, which migrate away from you in the, um, in the fall, morning cloaks actually overwinter here as adults, which I always think is totally crazy because they're such delicate little things, but they're able to hide behind tree bark and really do an amazing job of surviving the winter. And that means that they can come out early. Um, as soon as things start warming up and they thaw out, they can come out and fly around and you'll notice that they look pretty tattered. So this is a, this is a morning cloak I took a photo of in early April last year. And it was flying pretty erratically, kind of stretching out its wings, landing on the driveway a bunch and kind of getting used to that. And then um, eventually flew off. And you might wonder what morning cloaks are eating when they come out because usually butterflies love sipping on nectar, but there just aren't a lot of flowers that are um, full of nectar when they come out. And so what morning cloak butterflies eat is tree sap when they come out, which is also just a really kind of adorable image, I think. Um, because of course, when we have these big winds like we have had in the beginning of March this year, a lot of trees branches are breaking when the trees get injured and this flowing, you'll have uh, tree sap dropping out of the trees. And so that's an ideal spot for a morning cloak butterfly to go and get some much needed nutrients and sugars to survive. So then once those things are out of the way, out of the way we start seeing some more birds returning to the area, which um, you know, birds tend to be a more obvious thing because they start singing more, not these guys in particular, but a lot of other birds start singing more. So what are these two species that are here? At least one of them should be pretty obvious. Yeah, osprey and the turkey vulture. The osprey is on the top left and the turkey vulture is on the bottom right. So um, they start coming back, ospreys in particular, when our rivers have really started opening back up and they can find more fish to eat, which we'll talk about a particular fish they like in just a moment. And turkey vultures, likewise, um, when all that roadkill and other winter killed animals start thawing out, that's really great for them. So they can come back and, and scavenge away on the, the dead creatures that are out there. One of um, my favorite things about turkey vultures, you know, they can be kind of grotesque to a lot of people uh, because they, you know, they excrete all over their legs to help them stay cool, but that also helps keep the bacteria down, which is good because if you're exclusively eating rotting meat and walking through it all the time, you have to worry about excess bacteria building up. So excreting all over their legs helps with that. They also, if you ever come across a turkey vulture nest, 
really cool, but stay away from them uh, because they will vomit at you as a defense mechanism. And it's this really gross caustic vomit, vomit that you would not want on you. So um, that's, a, that's another cool turkey vulture adaptation. And they also are just the essential workers, one of the many essential workers of our ecosystems that really helps with cleaning up waste, in particular, all that roadkill that we make. So who knows what species of frog this is? It's a tricky one. We don't so often see them. It's not a leopard frog. It's a wood frog. Good job, Terry. So yeah, this is a wood frog. And I love wood frogs because I certainly hear them more than I see them. And they are the first frog sound that I hear in my area in the spring. And everybody knows what a spring peeper chorus sounds like. It's beautiful and sort of angelic. And wood frogs, I would not describe that way. They sort of sound like ducks. So if you're walking through the forest where there might be a vernal pool and you hear this sort of quacking sound that's often written out as a ruck sound, a chorus of that in early spring when there still might be ice or snow patches on the ground, that's the um, duck-like quack of the wood frog. And they're pretty cool because they're uh, our amphibian. It's the amphibian in North America that has the northernmost range. And they can do that because they basically freeze solid in the wintertime. Their heart rate essentially stops. They stop breathing. Uh, and you would think that they were dead, but then they thaw out in the spring and they get ready to breed in vernal pools and they make a cute little duck sound. And when you hear one in the, in the forest as you're hiking along, you have to, if you want to be able to see one, you tend to have to really approach slowly because once a, a chorus of wood frogs hears you coming, they'll shut off like a light and it can be harder to find them again. So um, they're a pretty fun one because you can still have ice and snow on the ground, but you'll hear, you'll hear the wood frogs and know that spring is really coming and, and they've thawed out and woken up. So here are two species of asters that will start flowering towards the end of April usually. So who knows which these are? One of them should be pretty obvious, but the other one trips people up. Yeah, this foot is the one on the right. Good job, Suzanne. And dandelion is the one on the left. Correct. Nice job. Yeah, so um, these are both asters, uh, mem members of the daisy or aster family. And Colt's foot is, is neat because their flowers come out before their leaves do, but their leaves are also very obvious. They have big Colt's foot-like leaves that are um, really green, dark green on top, but their underside is this sort of white velvet, which is really beautiful and soft. Um, dandelions, they will flower after their leaves have, have come out, but you'll see Colt's foot really commonly in Washington County in ditches on the side of the road um, and also just kind of like sandy disturbed areas. Neither of these plants are native to North America, but they came here when European colonizers came here. They have a lot of valued medicinal properties, which is part of the reason they came here with Europeans. Um, and so they're, they're common weeds, but uh, they have some really useful properties and they're also very beautiful. So good ones to look for at the end of April. So this one's trickier, but who knows what, what kind of fish these might be. really common to come up some rivers and streams in May. Yeah, they're alewives. You guys are champs. You're so good. So um, yes, these are alewives and alewives are such a pleasure to see and their populations have really rebounded um, well in the past few years due to some great uh, fisheries habitat work um, and so alewives will just come charging up uh, streams from the ocean. 
And it's an amazing place to go looking for ospreys and eagles too, because it's such an ideal food source for them. So they're really exciting. If you're near a stream where you can see an alewife run, it's amazing to go and, and watch that happen. So these ones, who knows what these are? These should be pretty obvious, I hope. common food in grocery stores around here. Fiddleheads, yeah. So these are ostrich fern fiddleheads. I grew up, um, we were, we would gather fiddleheads a lot when I was a kid. We had some patches around where I lived and I still every year go uh, fiddleheading and freeze a bunch up for the year. It's my favorite. It's one of my favorites. I don't know how I would pick a favorite wild food, but fiddleheads are right up there. Um, but do note that if you're excited about fiddleheads and foraging, that ostrich fern fiddleheads are really the only um, reliably edible fiddlehead that we have in this area. And you really don't wanna eat other species of fiddleheads. So be really careful and make sure you know what you're doing. Um, and also be really thoughtful about harvest. So when people have discovered a lot of fiddlehead patches, they, they can be totally decimated. And that's been a problem around a lot of its range. So um, people often are very protective of their fiddlehead patches. And I always really encourage folks to take no more than a third of the um, fiddleheads in a given clump um, to really make sure that you leave a bunch behind if you choose to pick them. So these ones are common in fields. Does anybody know what these little tiny flowers you might see in your yard are called? So these ones are bluets and bluets are members of the coffee family. So it's kind of fun to have that tropical relative right in our own backyard. Um, they're just, they're, they're cute, they're very tiny, and they might give you sort of a, a second glance thinking that there's a patch of snow in your yard in the spring. <laughs> so um, they can surprise you a little bit, but um, don't worry, they're just fluids. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite um, phenology matches that happens. So um, they each give each other a clue as to their name. So let's see if you can get either one of them. Yeah, shadbush and shad. So on the left is the flowering of shadbush. Its other common names include Juneberry or serviceberry. Its scientific genus name is Amelanchia. So you might have heard it from any of those names that has a lot. And on the right is the shad, a fish. And when the shad bush is flowering, shad are running in rivers. So you know to go and fish for shad if you enjoy doing that. And so that's a, that's a great one because um, if you see one, you know the other one is going on. And it'll be interesting to see if climate change influences either of those differently and if we experience some phenological mismatch because right now they're still pretty matched in this area from what I've noticed. So a couple, these are the last two um, signs of spring before we dive into it. So who knows what this flower is? Beautiful native flower. I see this one a lot in Jonesport and Addison in particular, if you drive those places. It's Rhodora, though some of those other ones you named are close relatives, so good guess. Yeah, this is a, um, related to rhododendrons very closely, and they are beautiful because they create just these stunning fields of pink in areas like acidic ditches and bogs and places where you would not necessarily expect these great impressive shrubs of pink to exist. Um, so that's a, they tend to bloom towards the end of May, early June, and they're one of my favorite signs of, of summer coming. And then the last sign where I know that summer is really here and we hopefully should not have any more frosts <laughs> is in early June when the painted turtles and snapping turtles start laying their eggs. 
I've been living on a river for the past five years and they will have this regular parade of painted turtles and snapping turtles that come up from the river and go into my sandy driveway and lay their eggs. And then the raccoons and skunks will come at night and eat most of those eggs. Um, which is always a little bit sad, but that's what happens. And so uh, these all are um, really, you. I, we've had a couple times, I remember last year and a couple years before, we definitely had some, um, some, some frosts after they had laid their eggs. But usually we're really sure that summer, summer really is just, just around the corner and, and spring is at, its, is at its conclusion. So those are some of the spring signs to look for. And like I said, you can visit the nature of phenology.wordpress.com to um, dive into more detail on any of those species I just talked about. There were episodes on every single one of those that we talked about that you can learn about. And if you're a person also that has a family history of having seasonal sayings or phonology proverbs, you can submit those to us at, um, through the Nature of Phonology's blog, or you can type in bit.ly slash seasonal sayings, and it'll take you to a form where you can input those seasonal sayings so that we might feature them in a future episode. So seasonal sayings like mad as a March hare, that's one of my favorites because it indicates that in March, snowshoe hares get a little bit crazy because it's their breeding season. And so they'll just do really kind of erratic, crazy things. And so that's where that comes from. Or things like April showers bring May flowers. There's such a long human history of paying attention to nature's calendar. And uh, they're really important to capture those old sayings that often are, are getting lost with older generations and to capture our phonology observations so that we can notice how things change over time. And I think also with phonology, they really help us to um, really connect to our backyards and feel welcome and part of a community uh, that's outside of the human world. So I think with the pandemic, having that predictability of the species that are gonna to return to our area or the flowers that are gonna start blooming has really created a lot of peace for people. And so the more that you're connected with those things that are going on, um, the, the happier it can make you and it can be valuable to science. So to me, it's a win-win to pay attention to phenology. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you all to um, ask any questions in the Q&A form or um, by raising your hand. So we did have one question that said, what was the best way to identify the fiddleheads? Since it's that specific. Yeah, speech. great question. So one of the best ways is um, on the... Uh, the sort of stem of it, there's a V or U-shaped um, divot. And so that divot along the stem is a really important characteristic of the ostrich fern fiddlehead. And they also have a, a sort of amber colored papery covering on them. Um, of course, other fiddleheads have that papery covering, but the ostrich ferns is sort of uniquely that amber color, and that combined with the divot are two really important ways. There are other ways I invite you to look up and, and dive deep into, but those are, those are two pretty critical ones. Great question. Great. If anyone else has another question, you can feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the chat. I have a question, Hazel. If you could pass on one piece of advice to folks out there, what would it be? Oh, um, I think for me, my biggest advice would just be to start writing down the things in nature that you see. I think it's, it's really valuable uh, to just track those over time and, and start getting used to the patterns that are happening in your own backyard. And it's fun too. And if you like drawing, you can draw as well, or instead of writing. <laughs> Great, thank you. Sure. Yeah, any other questions or any other um, observations folks have made? If somebody raised yeah, I have a question coming in from Sally and Dawn. I'm gonna let you guys unmute. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. I think we're unmuted. Yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, my question is, do you have a link for the time article with the benefits of time outdoors? I do, and let me see. I can try to pull it up and pop it in the chat, and if not, I can email it to you afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Somebody asked me to sit on a panel and discuss that. That was a very nice, succinct list that I could borrow from. I'd appreciate it. Sure, yeah, I definitely, I can pull that up. Thanks. Watch if it comes in the chat. I can never find these things. I'm in a chat. Uh, it looks like Jane Bell has a question. Um, if anyone has seen a river of springtails this year. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of different species of springtails, but I, I'm betting that you're talking about snow fleas in particular. So snow fleas are those tiny little like black pepper jumpy things that you might see um, sort of as a kind of bluish skim on snow melt or <laughs> yes, millions <Yeah. laughs> on, on snow melt or like footprints that are melting or on um, like streams that are melting out. And uh, I, I see them every year. I, I usually tend to see them most actually in March because I just notice them more when, um, when, when things are thawing out and melting and you will see them in these big groups. And if you get really close to them and, and put your finger near one, you can see that they spring because they do have this cool tail that allows them to, to jump. Um, and there is, we do have a um, Nature of Phenology episode all about snow fleas. So if you want to learn all about them, you can. Um, they are very cool to see. And what I think is especially cool about them is that they're always around, even in the summer, but we can't see them in the summer because they camouflage so well. Um, on the forest floor. And so we tend to only really notice them when they're on that white backdrop. And um, if I recall correctly, what they love eating is pollen that is on the snow surface, which is kind of a cute um, image. <laughs> oh, cool. You saw them in Edmonds in February. Yeah. Hey, Ian, I'll be in sure to include that times link when I send out the recording link to you all. I'll make sure there are all the links are in that email as well. So you all will get the links that you can feel free to peruse. So perfect. Yeah, that. I'll send that link to you, Kathy. Perfect. Thanks, Hazel. I can't find it right now, but I can, I'll, I'll be able to for <laughs> a little bit more time. Cool. Yeah. The gray ghost. I don't know what the gray ghost is. Tell me more. What's the gray ghost? <laughs> oh, male harrier. Cool. That's pretty neat. In Millbridge, there's a there's a there's a northern harrier that tends to hang out in the summer. I have not seen it yet this year. But you know harriers because they have that dihedral wing shape like a turkey vulture has, which just means that when they're soaring, they have this V shape that's very teetery. And harriers in particular uh, spend a lot of time in open fields um, hunting um, right above the fields uh, for food. They'll eat rodents, they'll eat smaller birds. Um, and yeah, it's crazy because um, there's a lot of sexual dimorphism between um, northern harriers where um, there's what, uh, a gray, a really gray version that's just like totally gray and then the other is um, really brown. So the female is brown and the male is super gray. So they look really different, but they have that classic teetering dihedral kind of look, especially in open fields. Any more questions before we sign off? or recent other observations like hair. Yeah. That'd be cool to know. I noticed the morning dove started singing here about a week or so ago. Watched eagles mating this year. That's really cool. Very that cool. Been crazy. I noticed also yesterday the um, river where I live just opened up a little bit. It closed up last night, but it opened up in one spot and the um, beaver came out like, yes, I've been locked up under the ice and in the dark for months and I'm, I'm out of here. I'm stretching my legs, I'm gonna find some new food. But they probably were disappointed this morning <laughs> when they woke up, and like, oh, I'm trapped again. But um, that's always a fun one to look for. Yep. 
first woodcock. Yeah, I saw my first woodcock on Friday in Surrey, right along the coast. Um, got to see it doing its its crazy timber doodle dance in the sky. That's a definitely a favorite um, that comes out this time of year. Moths, yeah, I've been meaning to look up those moths. If anybody knows what those moths are, because I notice them every year at this time. Um, they're kind of big, uh, if we're thinking about the same moth, like maybe an inch, inch and a half across wingspan. And I do notice them. It's like, you'll still have snow on the ground. It's really cold. And they'll be like flopping on the window. And I don't, I've been meaning to dive into those and learn more. So um, let me know if you have any intel on the winter moths. <laughs> went down your jacket yeah I think they are called winter moths that's uh, which is like very helpful uh, to know there's also a caterpillar you can be looking for called the winter cutworm moth caterpillar um, that tend to come out on the on the snow um, this time of year like I saw yeah when is it last year I saw one on, on March 24th if I recall correctly so it makes me wonder if it's just those turning into an adult. Does it happen that quickly? I don't know. These are my questions. <laughs> mm, they cover your windows in late fall. Very few this past fall. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Well, I think without any more questions that's kind of we'll just wrap up there but thank you so much hazel and thank you everyone else for joining us today this was really great and we really appreciate it yeah thank you for having me it was so fun and thanks everyone for the questions and your great observations i always love knowing what people are noticing in the world around them so thanks for hosting yeah, thank you so much hazel and thank you kathy and everyone yeah. who came Yep, and if you guys want to tune in, our next one, I believe, Kendall, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's on the 29th, right? Yes, it's all about bats. Cool. All about bats, so we hope you guys can join us in for that. Nice. Great, well, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.